We're all still working through the post-pandemic world, still, and what it looks like, and there's no place more so where that's true than in the workplace. Internal communications teams are still at the forefront of this, let's call it an evolution, and have been tasked with engaging a more distributed and more demanding workforce than ever before. To talk with me about that, I'm here with Debbie DeWitt, Marketing Communications Manager for Physix, who's going to go through the internal communication trends for the year 2023. Hi, Deb. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everybody out there, for listening to this episode of Digital Sign is Done Right. You can follow along with a transcript on the Physics website. Just look under Resources Podcasts and uh, find this particular episode, and there it is. Plus, you can also subscribe if you feel so inclined. Whether you're using digital signage or not, our podcast gives you practical tips for communications and content to better engage your audience. I'm Derek DeWitt. Welcome to Digital Signage Done Right. So, Deb, I read on the Beekeeper website, quote, in 2023, businesses will continue to operate through an unpredictable environment by staying laser focused on efficiencies, digital technologies, and connected communications. Yeah, that's a great summary. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. You can tell <laughs> you can tell that's a blog writer. <laughs> they need to massage that. <laughs> right, right. But it's a, it's an excellent blog and a, and a good site. But uh, yeah, basically the, the thing is we're not settled down yet. There were a lot of changes that happened. It's all kind of leveling out now. Um, and when I went out there to look at what experts are saying, there's some consensus about internal communication trends for this year, but people kind of disagree on what takes priority. So I just went out and did sort of a bundled wrap up and put them in the order that I liked. Aha, uh-huh. so this is, uh, this is pulling from multiple sources. Yeah, it's all trends that I thought stood out and I combined a ton of top six, top eight, 10, 12 lists, you know, that everybody uh-huh. puts yeah. out there. But I think each of these things is worth talking about. Do you see a big difference between uh, 2023 and 2021, which is when we did our last Trends of the Year episode? I know, we got lazy in 2022. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> the trend was no. <laughs> <laughs> right. We were busy. That was the big quit. <laughs> yeah, then we were busy. Uh, there is certainly crossover between 2021 and now, um, but there are also several new ones. A lot of these emerged in 2020, 2021, but they're, like you said in your intro, they're evolving. We're starting to get used to them. We're starting to optimize them, figure out what works best. Okay, so, uh, so let's get to it. So the first item you have is continued collaboration and peer-to-peer communications. Yes, collaboration. The buzzword continues. It will live forever, I believe, but it is still very important, Um, especially with workplaces still morphing. You know, we've got some hybrid, some all in the office, some all on the front line. If it's obviously healthcare, hotel, factories, we've got some that are fully remote. And then you've got these companies who change their minds every few weeks and Ah, say, now we're half remote. Now you have to come in, things like that. So keeping everyone on the same page and allowing teams to thrive is still top of the list. And collaboration, wherever you're working from, is still top of that list. Right. And the fact is, people are going to talk amongst themselves. Uh, Colleagues will always talk if they're in the office. They're going to chit chat at each other's desks, cubicles, office doors, the the proverbial water cooler. And they're going to do that whether the company is providing a means for them to do so or not. It's only a problem when, A, there's something toxic going on in the, uh, the office atmosphere, or they're using public forums to have these conversations, which is not good. Don't air your dirty laundry. Nobody wants to see that. Or they're communicating with each other using apps that are themselves insecure. And so therefore opening the door for, you know, badness. Yeah. That's why collaboration tools, collaboration platforms have become so important because I mean, I think years ago, companies realized our people are going to form their own groups on Facebook or wherever, uh, whether we give them a platform or not. So having those collaboration tools in place, getting them more streamlined, a lot of what we're seeing is uh, combining things or scrapping some of them. Instead of having six different tools, let's land on one that everybody likes, everybody will use. Like you said, security is an issue. Modern intranets you know, are really becoming more like a social media platform in a way. Mm-hmm. They're allowing a lot more social posts from employees. They're allowing commenting, things like that. Because like you said, we want you on our platform so that we can stay abreast of what's going on, what 
what people are talking about. Right. And there's no reason a, an intranet needs to be stuffy. No. I mean, it can be, like you say, almost like a social media thing. It's just we're the only people who see it. Yeah. Uh, I saw somebody refer to them as digital culture hubs, which I really <laughs> liked. Yeah, and, you know, we've talked for a long time about democratizing communications. You know, that's what intranets, social sites are doing, collaboration tools. You can also do it with digital signage, you know, let people at the team level add their own messaging since they know what their group cares about. But I will say a big priority now is setting boundaries for these collaborations Mm. and peer to peer communications. Everybody needs work life and home life to be separated. The more we're going online, the more people are intruding into home life. So a lot of companies, another big thing that goes with this topic is setting those boundaries between home and work life so that you don't get digital fatigue or burnout or collab fatigue, whatever you want to call it. When I'm off the clock, I'm off the clock, pal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now, having said that, number two on your list is more authority for frontline managers. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah, we're staying focused on employees and staffing is a big issue. Understaffing has been a real challenge the past couple of years and it remains so today. Um, Managers need more autonomy to build up that staff and keep them happy. Mm. So they need to have the tools and authority to tackle issues really quickly right then and there without having to go up the chain, you know? Right. I'd say agility is very important in in a fast moving world. Yeah. And, you know, agency, they need to be able to do what they need to do. Mm. And one of the things they're doing, employee listening is a big topic, which to me seems funny because you'd think that's a constant, right? Listen Uh. to your employees. But this is, (laughs) yeah, but this is a very specific thing. Employee listening is really keeping a close eye on how employees are feeling to spot new trends while they're still emerging. And you're not just talking about just surveys. And I say that because we did a previous episode on the do's and don'ts of surveys, but also because it pops into my head more than just surveys. Absolutely. This isn't about surveys. Surveys are top level, big, wide, broad things. But when you want deep insights, you need to conduct regular focused listening activities so you get more accurate information. Uh, The next item is people want to see leadership more often. Do they? Yeah, yeah. Not only those frontline managers, but a lot of people want to see the C-suite. They expect them to be more involved. Uh, And obviously the big word, transparency. They want to see them. They want to hear what they have to say. And they want them to be more transparent about the mission, the values, the purpose, what the company's doing, what they stand for. Uh, I saw a couple of sites that called this the purpose revolution. Hmm. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. It's uh, people wanting clarity. They want certainty about how they fit into that purpose or fit into that mission. It needs to be more than just, our job is to make money. You know, uh, I think specifically when it comes to uh, environmental issues uh, and also some of the societal changes that we're seeing today, uh, a lot of people, and yes, I know I sound like an old person when I say this, but yes, younger people, Gen Z especially, like they don't really want to work for a company that's not doing what they think they should be doing in these realms. Absolutely. I hate to say surveys, but surveys have shown that over and over, especially like you said, the younger workforce. And it's only going to continue in that vein, I think. Mm. But uh, when it comes to internal communications, I read a great statement that said, by putting organizational values front and center, internal comms moves beyond messaging toward collective action. Because, you know, communicators have to not only tell you what that mission or purpose is, but what they're doing toward it. So you're actually sort of gathering people together, building momentum toward that purpose. Right. And speaking of transparency, like I think we see now, even in just the last few years, more and more companies are being much more uh, transparent on what they're doing for sustainability, whether it's, you know, net zero carbon initiatives yeah. or, or carbon replacement or, you know, hey, turn off that light. Uh, DNI uh, initiatives, which is diversity and inclusion, and and how that's all kind of working into the overall mission and goals of the company. We're seeing this more and more. Yeah, yeah. And we did actually a whole episode on authenticity and transparency where we get into this in more detail. Uh, the basic is people need to know you're really working toward your stated mission or purpose. And if you don't show that to them, they're going to lose trust in management. And so this is why they want to see the C-suite more often. They want to see those frontline managers. And, you know, this may be virtual. This may be a town hall. It may be an online meeting, but they want connection more often so that they can check in on how we're doing. 
Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, recently, I've been coming across, um, you know, the term employee engagement, mm, which has I do been know it. One, I'm, I'm yeah, familiar with it. One of the one of the buzz terms of the past, let's say, five years. Um, some places are now changing that up and referring to employee alignment, which I think is kind of nice because it doesn't feel as subordinate as engagement or like with engagement, it feels like the employees are customers or fish that need to be caught. Whereas with alignment, there's this kind of idea of they're independent autonomous entities and you're trying to just match things up, which I think is kind of nice. Yeah. I mean, employee alignment is actually, you know, engagement is like you said, it's sort of hooking them, getting their attention, you know, get them to look. Whereas alignment is get them to look at what, get them to do what. And what that is, is aligning them with that mission, with that purpose, making sure that at every level they're aligned with whatever you've set as your goals. Recently, I read something Gardner says, 24% of hybrid and remote workers report feeling connected to their organization's culture. That's only only 24% 24 connected to culture. And then Gallup found employee engagement they're using that term still, declined from 2021 to 2022. Mm. And they're seeing it continue to go down this year so far. Um, And I thought it was very interesting, the different elements that declined the most, because apparently engagement was at like this high. Right. Just before the pandemic, it was like, all right, we're all in it together. Yeah, yeah. And then stay home. (laughs) Well, that's, I mean, that makes sense. People like to be around other people. They were used to doing things a certain way. So we all had to shift. We had a big hiccup. Everybody had to relearn how to do their jobs, how to talk to each other. It's interesting. The things that did go down though, are clarity of expectations. So we're back to purpose. We're back to Mm -hmm. leadership connection to the mission or purpose of the company, opportunities to learn and grow opportunities to do what employees do best meaning don't just give me the task you want me to do, let me do what I'm best at, Mm. and feeling cared about at work. You know, Mm. those are all the places that people said, hey, I'm just not feeling it as much as I used to. Well, I think that uh, that, uh, transitions quite nicely into the next thing here, which is more human-centric communications. Finally, we've been talking about this. They're talking about it. We've been talking about this for years, and finally, 2023, is this when it's finally going to happen? Yeah, I I think everybody's been going toward it. It takes a while for the experts and the writers to start writing about it after it's been been being done. Been being done? Been being done. Been being done. That's correct. Yeah, so again, as we're seeing more of the leadership, we're also seeing less hierarchy in companies, but also more informal communications. People are being a little less stiff as they come out and talk to their employees, certainly. And that makes sense because those workers want more authenticity. You know, they don't want the boilerplate statements. They don't want formal decrees being handed down from on high. And, you know, the fact is that employees are people. And I know that they're there for, you know, a job or a particular set of tasks or to leverage certain skills that they have or knowledge that they have. But they're also people and they have opinions about the world that we all live in and that the company exists in. And yes, sometimes that's politics. Sometimes that's going to be uh, social issues. Uh, Sometimes it's going to be whether cats are better than dogs, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Controversial. We're starting to also see now some companies are, I mean, they're trying to stay away from the dicier stuff, but some companies are taking a stand on these real world issues that uh, that we all deal with all the time anyway. Yeah, that, and I don't know that if they are staying away from the dicier stuff. You have companies who, you know, you've always had companies that endorse political candidates, things like that. But mm. I think it is more common now that companies, they used to feel it, it was taboo. You don't want to offend anyone. Certainly, you know, not on the employee side, but certainly on the client side. We are seeing that change. It's part of the human centric. We all understand humans have opinions and a corporation, even though a legal entity is people. And so they're starting to say this corporation, this entity feels this way about this issue. Uh, Another thing I've noticed uh, that's shifting a little bit in the language is we've talked about localization a lot where, you know, uh, you want to have the people in the Houston office need to have information, for example, in emails in the newsletter and on their digital signs that is relevant to people in Houston. They don't need to know that it's snowing in Boston. But now we're starting to see talk of personalization. Yeah, internal comms is definitely trying to use personalization where it's possible. You know, you want to speak to an individual or at least the team versus the company as a whole. And uh, that's definitely figuring into how they're crafting their communications, but also how they deliver them. So I see the next item here is make 
your content more visual to spark that kind of uh, engagement, which is, you know, I mean, that's great for a digital signage company because it's a visual communications platform. That's true. And it's it's not just making things visual, but more visual content, just quantity as well as quality. Uh, we've always talked about the effectiveness of visual communications, so I guess the world is catching up, yay. But a recent study revealed that 67% of employees are better at completing tasks when communicated by video or text with an image along with it. Hmm. So, And they also said a business can save $1,200 or more in productivity per employee just by using more visuals. So that's, you know, that just makes sense. Right. I think as, as a number of studies showed pre-pandemic, uh, engagement equals productivity. And so if visual content gets more engagement, therefore visual content equals productivity. I think that's pretty easy math. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> Try and turn every communication into a visual if you can. We've always said this because of course, like as you said, we sell a visual product. But it's true. People just do better with visuals. So try and turn it into a visual if you can. If you have to use text, at least have some kind of really eye-catching visual with it. Mobile first is really the trend in communications. It's it's a crazy thing, but I guess people just... I don't use my mobile device like this, but I guess most people do. Is Mobile's their go-to device, and so a lot of communications, especially visual ones, are now getting tailored with mobile in mind, and then, oh, and by the way, here's also what it might look like on a desktop, you know. Uh, I think I saw this referred to as location-independent communication, which you might think sounds, thats I mean, that ties right into personalization over localization. Yeah, I think it does. We're still dealing with a fluid workforce and people working from home. You know, you said you don't use it that way, but I think most people go to their phones first. Mm. Obviously, we're all stuck on our desktops a lot, but mobile's better because then you can reach them wherever they are. You don't have to do it during a set time period when you have some people who are working. You know, I work at my desk for a couple of hours, but then I do work on my tablet or I go to a cafe and work on a smaller screen. So you need to design those communications for mobiles. Uh, they don't have to be, you know, they are saying mobile first but there are a lot of things that cross over you can make right, one thing mobile only exactly you can make designs that work on your digital signs that also work on social media that also work on a mobile uh, if you're delivering it via teams playlist something like that but it's keeping that focus on mobile so that you don't forget about the people who are out there looking at it on a very small screen i mean this has always been the the question for me for a digital signage company like Physix, though, isn't this kind of a problem? Well, it's fine for us because we can deliver to mobiles, so it's uh, not a problem. We have we have either a little app you can put in Teams that'll throw up your visual messages, or you can just deliver it to a website. People can look at it there. Uh, there's also, and you know, this has been every year for the past few years, but uh, continued focus on both safety and well-being. Yeah, people are still dealing with stressors of the last few years, and we have our normal stress that we would be having anyway. So as we've said, we're still in a period of uncertainty, and really, I mean, we're always in a period of uncertainty. Right, every every moment, until clairvoyance becomes a real thing. Uh, yeah, it's a, uncertainty is kind of the human condition. Yeah, the world's always changing, so there's always going to be stress. Yeah. And employees expect more attention to wellness from their employer. You know, because we all saw it. Everybody got on board with wellness during the pandemic and everybody uh, went, that's really nice. You showing me desk stretches and, you know, uh, stress relief tips. And, and you have hand sanitizer around and this is how to, you know, clean off your desk effectively and all that. And yeah, now that the pandemic's over, it's like, if all that messaging goes away, it's kind of saying, so now we don't really care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Which and so is not true, but I, but it, and it hasn't gone away. No, I don't, I don't know of anyone who yanked it. It's, it's actually been a great, uh, I would say opportunity for employers mm -hmm. to go, Oh, wow. You know, we have a benefits package. We have this and that. What else can we do for our employees? Well, we can absolutely focus on their wellness and their safety, obviously in, you know, manufacturing environments, things like that. You have to have safety messaging. And I will say HR is very focused right now on relationship management we talked about staffing as an issue, and that means also retention of employees. You know, you want to make a good employee experience so that you can keep those employees. Mm. You know, they're doing wellness programs. They're doing benefits reinforcement on a regular basis. Pay transparency is also something becoming more common now, mm. which uh, several states, I guess, have made it a law so that, like, you have to post a fair salary, like a realistic salary that you're going to pay somebody when you do job postings. You know, internally, people see those job postings, too. So people are starting to get pay transparency. And um, 
I don't know. I, I think focusing on well-being is a is a priority that should have always been here, and I'm I'm thrilled that it's it is here now. The next item you have here, the eighth is that scheduling is more important than ever. What? What does that mean? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, we get we get to work where we want. So people are also saying, hey, I want to work when I want. Ah. They, you know, they want more say over their schedules and they want advance notice if those shifts are changing. They want more flexibility. And they also want the power to exchange shifts mm. or swap with someone else. And, you know, we talked about those frontline managers. They want to be able to get instant approval for those changes right away. Mm. So, you know, with more flexibility in work hours, the focus is shifting to outcome versus hours. So you used to have managers going, hey, I need you to work you know, 40 hours exactly or more this week. Now they're going, I need you to get these things done. And if you got those things done, do them when and where you like. And you'll be paid for it. Of course. (laughs) And paid well, because right now people really need to keep those employees happy. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, Obviously, AI is very much the talk, even though it's not it's not true AI. I'm going to be niggly about that, but Nerd. there is there is what we call artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning stuff out there being used more and more by uh, organizations for all kinds of things, and more automation is coming around. Now, this is the part for the more conspiratorially minded people out there to start chewing their fingernails and muttering in the corner about Skynet. I can't wait. I want it to come right now. I said, <laughs> not Skynet. Skynet. Well, not Skynet. Yes. Not Skynet. But automation and AI, I'm all for. Uh, but remember, our focus here is internal communication trends. So we're not talking about robots. We're talking about Terminator or Skynet. But it means more automation of messaging and mm. of communications practices. So, you know, repetitive messaging, HR announcements, schedules can be automated especially on digital signs where you can pull stuff in. Um, You can automate surveys when you're doing those top level surveys. Uh, People are using chat bots and this is for employees. This is not for the the public website. They're Mm -hmm. using chat bots for, you know, benefits questions. Hey, I need my current PTO hours, things like that. And um, they're offering on-demand learning tools for professional development. You know, that helps automate onboarding and training. Uh, I read something recently about how AI is also being used to map employee personas and experiences, meaning that it can kind of take all of the interactions with employee F and um, and kind of come up with a profile. Oh, employee F is this kind of a person. Here are some of that person's characteristics. They fit into this cohort of people who have these things uh, in common or are similar. So then they can kind of use that to work out new communication strategies. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, it's not just personas, it's also experiences. And those are like little micro journeys. What's the onboarding experience like? What's the training experience like? Mm -hmm. What's their, you know, if uh, you happen to be, I don't know, a customer service agent, what is the little experience of the whole system of taking a, a client call, helping them logging that in your system? You know, these little micro journeys, they're looking at those and you know social media is doing this we've been we've all been packaged and sold as personas so yeah. some of this ai is coming into the corporate world but it's you know being used for good it's not being used for evil this is so that we can understand people and hopefully be able to talk to them to communicate with them give them the internal communications they need and want and companies can use these profiles to create those little micro journeys and optimize those micro journeys especially for like common tasks or FAQs or little campaigns that they want to put out. Sure. I mean, it is essentially the same tech that, say, Facebook uses or other social media uses. They're using this stuff to go, okay, these are the kinds of ads we should be serving this particular user. In this instance, it's not ads that are being served up. It's opportunities, it's programs, it's initiatives, it's uh, options. Yeah, I mean, advertising is one kind of communications, you know, that we call it marketing instead of communications. But internal communications, you could say, are advertising to your employees, and advertising is communications to external people. It's the same thing, but done for different purposes. You know, your next item here says workers want still more training and knowledge sharing, yeah. which is very, very true. I recently saw a study by Exonify that uh, uncovered some pretty interesting stats about frontline training. So half of frontline employee respondents have taken on new tasks 
since the beginning of the pandemic, which I think is probably no surprise. Right, but that's in many cases on top of what they were already doing. Right, and 52% of them say they were not provided with the training that they needed in order to take on these new responsibilities. And 84% said they would prefer to access their training from a personal mobile device. So then we come back to that mobile first communications uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. And internal communications needs to focus on training topics, on professional development, and make employees aware of certification or training opportunities. Uh, as we talked about, more visual content. So if you've got little video snippets of how to, or you've got training online, you need to point them that way. The other thing that was mentioned was knowledge sharing in addition to training. So you can promote knowledge sharing by sending out updates and putting it on digital signs. But also, it's really important to hold get togethers, meetings, brainstorming sessions, you know, in person knowledge sharing. And some of that is documenting it as SOP, standard operating procedure, things like that. But a lot of it is person to person because the goal is to make sure everybody is actively engaged in sharing the knowledge they have. Yeah. I mean, I personally, I love me a good brainstorming session. Like that's, that's my meat and potatoes. A whiteboard is your friend. Oh boy. I love a whiteboard. I love the. I even like the smell of the markers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, one thing you might want to put on a whiteboard would be, for example, a workflow. And your next item says that workflows need to be streamlined and simplified, which I think I, I think the word we can use really is optimized. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's especially important because everybody's talking about change management right now in mm -hmm. these uncertain times in the quote new normal. Uh, you know, everything's changing. We're still getting our feet. We're still working out those systems. It's a great opportunity to go back and look at your workflows and go, hey, as we just said, our workers took on a lot more work. We have to train them on everything. Why don't we take this opportunity to have them take a look at this workflow and see if it's the best it can be? Mm. So internal communication professionals can be involved in change management you know, at every step, really. The planning, the execution, but mainly communicating that change. And with teams more spread out and turnover is more common, unfortunately, you know, that's that's the old, in case I'm hit by a bus scenario, you need to have workflows documented. You need to have that, mm -hmm. that SOP written down. That's true for your internal comms team, you know, just like every other department. And, uh, and don't just do it once. Uh, I'm a firm believer in continuous improvement systems. Yeah. Streamline it, fix it up, make it better, and then revisit it again in six months and, and do it again because things are changing all the time and there's no reason to ever stop being better. That's very true. I, that's that's the goal, isn't it? The goal is when every single person doing a task or a job looks at the procedure, the workflow, and goes, "Nope, nothing could be done better." Right. That would be that would be the best. Uh, of course, one way to do that is by analyzing things, and we find that more formalized analytics are driving more decisions these days. I don't know if that's because we have so much more sort of communication uh, at all levels of the organization, if that's because we have AI, because we have better data sharing uh, technologies, but analytics is really coming into its own this year. Yeah, it's on every list. There was no list without analytics or data-driven decision-making. And I think it's a combination of all those things you talked about. You know, it is AI, but it's not even AI. Just as we are able to collect more data, we're getting more sophisticated in how we can parse and filter and, and analyze that data. So we have more data and we're better at using it. For internal communications, you know, it's not only determining where, when, what you communicate, it's looking at the ROI for those. We've talked about this a lot for digital signage and communications in general. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I saw that I really liked is people are calling this evidence-based communications, <laughs> which I like. It's like there's proof That's behind forensic. it. <laughs> it is, It is, but it's like instead of saying, oh, what's your ROI, What you know, which has just become a throwaway term almost, you know, what's your return, what's your success, all that. It's evidence-based because we are talking about making decisions. So make those decisions based on evidence. It's not just, hey, we have these numbers. It's we've looked at these numbers, we've analyzed the data, and we've come to this decision based on the evidence. 
So the one thing is there will be a lot more work for internal communications teams to turn those analytics and that data into visuals. As we talked about, visual content, video snippets. And stories. Turn them, whenever you can, turn them into some kind of a, I mean, it's, you know, you're not right more in peace here, but some kind of short form narrative. It just sticks in the mind better. It's the easiest way to remember things is narratively. Yeah, I think people absorb stories or data, you know, given to you as a visual or a story much easier than they do. You're going to send out a spreadsheet or, I mean, if anybody's ever read like an end of year financial report from a company, you know, the executive summary is what everyone reads because it's yeah. a story. It, it's putting it into text uh, with meaning and context as opposed to here's the data. Yeah, that's exactly so. Or anybody who uh, looks out at uh, on the web at academic papers, the abstract is available. And then if you want to read the paper, you have to sign up and download it and sometimes pay for it. But I've the never abstract is available. I've never downloaded one. I I've just never read either. the abstract. I read the abstract and go, huh, I bet they probably proved their point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I read the articles that say whether it was verified by peers or not. Yeah, that's for sure. So that is a lot for communicators to consider in the internal communications realm. We're moving away from that old fashioned one size fits all approach. We're using more tech, but we're also at the same time becoming more human in our messaging. And uh, so those are the, I think we had a dozen, even dozen internal communications trends for the year 2023 and beyond. And beyond. (laughs) Thanks to Debbie DeWitt, Marketing Communications Manager at Vizix, for talking to me today about these internal communication trends for 2023. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Derek. Always great to be on. And it's always good to know that you out there are listening to this podcast, Digital Signage Done Right. Again, you can follow along with a transcript on the Vizix website under resources. Find the webpage for this podcast episode. For more free stuff, head to resources on physics.com for guides, videos, and more to help with your visual communications. Please subscribe and share and contact us for information about our digital signage solutions.